This man really exists who wrote these books. They were just so transcendental. I just couldn't even believe it was somebody on this planet, yet everybody in the temple knew him. They were all the ISKCON press devotees. They were all in Boston. They all knew him. And so, uh, but still I doubted, is this man really here? And so until the day I met him, I had this doubt. Is he going to really walk through those doors? So the day before I got initiated, we had just gotten to New York. I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time. We missed his arrival at the airport because our temple president, Damodar, felt that our business wasn't just to go and gawk at him. He wanted us to stay out on Sankatan and just go up there just to get initiated, and that's it. So the night before, Krapa was giving Bhagavad Gita classes every night because in the morning he had initiation every morning for a week. So he wasn't giving class. He was just doing initiation. So the night before... I go into the temple room. It's a hot July night, packed with devotees. And I'm just sitting there looking at the door, waiting for him to come through. And I remember that, that um, Kirti Raj Prabhu was going around and tapping devotees on the shoulder and saying, can you leave because there's not enough room for everybody and there's still people in the hallway that never saw Prabhupada. And he asked me that, and I had never seen Prabhupada. He, he, Prabhupada had been there for a couple of days, but I had just arrived. And when he said that to me, I, just, I, I didn't budge. I'm just staying here. I'm going to see Srila Prabhupada. And because I stayed put, sure enough, with a matter of time, Prabhupada walked through the door, and all those doubts that I had had went completely out the window. And it was like seeing an old friend I hadn't seen in so long. So it was, that was my experience, seeing Srila Prabhupada the first time. He was an old, old friend, and I'd just forgotten about him. In the couple of months before we met Srila Prabhupada, when Gorsan, Gary and I were living in the uh, Haight-Ashbury area, there were some flyers that were distributed. And they said things like, the Swami is coming to town. Uh, Chant and be high forever, this sort of thing. I'm sure you've heard of them. And I remember Gary looking at one of these flyers that said, the Swami is coming to town, and him saying, well, when this Swami comes to town, we'll go see him and we'll do whatever he says to do. It's, it's just the whole thing was such a mystical, uh, incredible experience in that we were actually very well situated in, at miles away, 1,500 miles away in, in Texas, and we were drawn there. And I think this is true of many other, many other uh, people. So then... Uh, we went to Frederick Street and uh, found out about when the classes were and so forth. Made an appointment with Srila Prabhupada and Mukunda Das, who later became Mukunda Goswami, uh, arranged for us to visit uh, Srila Prabhupada. So in our first meeting with him, private meeting with him, he took us up to his apartment. I remember waiting pensively to meet Srila Prabhupada. He brought us in. And so Prabhupada was sitting in, you know, those little bay windows that they have in San Francisco, these apartments with bay windows. He was sitting in a sunlight, looking very effulgent and very peaceful. And he sat in a chair, and there was another chair opposite. I think he sat in the lounge chair, and I sat in the rocking chair, or vice versa. I can't remember that one point, but... We were opposite one another, and Gorsundra, Gary, sat on the floor. And we began to, he began to ask us questions all about our lives, what we were doing, who we were, where we had come from. He was very personally interested in, in us. And, I mean, he was very personally interested in each of his disciples, each of his students. But he asked us, you know, if we were students, what we were studying. We told him we had been studying art and that we were artists. Uh, he asks about our parents, our family, so many things. 
uh, I, in the course of the conversation, I told him that I had studied art in Europe and that I had traveled all over Europe and studied in various places. And he was quite surprised. He raised his eyes and said, oh, you have traveled so much? Because uh, I was very young. I looked, I looked like I was 16. I was actually 19 or 20. And I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. Yes. He wasn't called Prabhupada yet. Yes, but none of it has made me happy. And he smiled and said, ah, that is required. To actually be disgusted with material life. When Prabhupada did the initiation, he, we sat on the floor with Prabhupada. Uh, I got initiated with Jayatirtha was there. Ujjvala got initiated at the same time. Can't remember the others. Anyhow, Prabhupada sat on the floor. We watched him chant on the beads. Um, he did the fire sacrifice. And then when he came around to giving us our names, and he, and he came to me and he, and he was going to give me my beads and my name, and he goes, you know, your name is Tulsi Das. And I, somehow or other I got this, some kind of look on my face like, or whatever, and Prabhupada looks at me and he goes, is that all right? <laughs> I said, oh yes, Prabhupada. And I was so shocked because I was just a new devotee and I hardly recognized any of the names. But I knew the name Tulsi Das because we'd done the Tulsi worship and all that. So that was kind of, that was kind of uh, my first real kind of personal interaction with Prabhupada. When I went up to the Vyasasam and I called my name, Aravinda was sitting to Prabhupada's side and he would say the name first. And when you're that close to Prabhupada, you could hear the name before Prabhupada said it. So I was already kind of bowled over by the name Mahamaya. <laughs> and then Prabhupada said it, and there was this sort of shocked silence in the temple room. <laughs> and then Prabhupada cracked up and started laughing. So then everyone laughed, <laughs> including myself. <laughs> and then he said something like, the illusory energy. The illusory energy is not all bad. <laughs> he said, um, for one who does not want to serve Krishna, the illusory energy is there. And he gave the example of the moon. There are phases of the moon, and Mahamaya was a phase of Radharani's energy. So I don't remember um, him handing me back my beads or anything, but I just remember that experience of being in front of him. And I felt like he was seeing me, not the layers of false ego that I thought I was, but he was just seeing the soul. And it was just such a wonderful he definitely was like lifting me up to his platform and and just it was just really a nice exchange with Prabhupada. At the time of the initiation, there were no saris, there were no social customs, none of these things. And I had been an art student, and art students wear jeans. So I was actually initiated in blue jeans. Well, actually they were beige jeans with paint stains on them. It didn't seem to matter to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, but that was what our life was like at that time. Uh, when I tell people I was initiated in jeans, they're just amazed. But most of us, we didn't know what saris were yet. So during my initiation, I remember watching the ceremony and seeing him putting the flower, putting the colored dyes, and putting the uh, making the fire, building the fire. And I remember thinking, what is this? What, am I what is the depth of the meaning of this? What is really going on? In other words, I, wasn't, I didn't have the kind of, uh, I didn't have the background. I mean, there was no Bhagavad Gita printed yet, for one thing. The only thing we had were Prabhupada's three books. So we did read those right away. And the first a job that he gave us was painting a great big four foot by four foot Radha Krishna painting. But during my initiation, I had some misgivings. So then after the initiation, I went to see Srila Prabhupada and I, I, I went upstairs to, to visit him. And I told him that um, I didn't feel liberated. I thought that when I got initiation, by golly, it was going to be nirvana immediately. I was going to be liberated. And uh, he was very patient with me. He said, yes, just see the fan over here. 
There was a fan sitting in the corner. If I unplug it, it may spin a few more times, but because it has been unplugged, it will stop eventually. So it's like that. Your material life, although it may not cease immediately, because it has been unplugged, it will spin a few more times. But just do the process as I told you. So he explained it very beautifully, very, very gently. One uh, experience I had at that time, I was, uh, I'd studied the pronunciation for the Sri Shopanishad with Pradumne in New York, but I only knew the first six verses. Now it said that the guru knows everything about the disciple, knows everything. So he, and he, he's expert in using, engaging the disciple and using all, anything, anything the disciple has to offer. The pure devotee is expert in, in, in using that and engaging it. So I only knew these six verses, and uh, a, an impersonal uh, Mayavadi Swami came to visit Prabhupada at Berry Place. So when he came in, Prabhupada gave him all respects and had me put a cushion down for him. And then he said, please go make up a fruit plate. And I ran down and made up a fruit plate and came up. And I went over to Prabhupada to offer it to him first. And he said, no, offer it to our guest. And I went over and offered it to Swami. And I came back to offer it to Prabhupada. And he said, sit, sit down. <laughs> I thought, OK. So I sat down. Prabhupada looked at the sannyasi, the Swami. And he said, my boys all know Sanskrit. <laughs> and I thought, oh no, what is he up to now? And he was beaming, and he, he looked at me and he said, chant Sri Shopanishad. <laughs> and so I started chanting, you know, Om Purnam Arak Purnam Idam Purnat Purnam Udachite Purnasya Purnamada in perfect meter, and I'm as best I could. So I get up to the fourth verse, and I'm thinking, Prabhupada, I only know six. <laughs> but I kept going, you know, I had faith. I got up to the fifth, the fifth verse and I was really sweating, but I kept going. And when I started on the sixth verse, I felt like Drupadi, you know, about to come unraveled. And I, and I was mentally, I was saying to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I only know six. I only know six. <laughs> And when I got on the second line of the sixth verse, Prabhupada looked at me, just as I was finishing, he went, that will be enough, you can go now. <laughs> so he used, even though I only had that much knowledge, he used it perfectly, um, you know, and got the maximum value out of my very little bit of knowledge, you know. So that was a very nice experience. At the Pandal, there was a Pandal set up for every night. And the most significant thing that I remember was after Prabhupada gave his lecture, he asked for questions, and one man came up to the microphone, and he was challenging, and he said, um, can you show me a miracle? And of course, we were all thinking of Sai Baba or these other gurus who you know, can produce ashes in their hands and things like that. And that's probably what he was demanding, you know, can you do something like that? Maybe he even mentioned that, I don't remember exactly, but Prabhupada just looked at the 150 of us sitting on the stage in front of him and just swooped his hand in front to indicate us and said, this is my miracle. I have changed these Malachas and Yavanas into Vaishnavas. And we were all cheering, Hari Bol, Jai, we were, we were just so happy to be his, his examples, you know, <laughs> and um, of his examples of success. Srila Prabhupada immediately engaged us as artists. He knew that we were art students before, so his very first project was to have me paint a great big four foot by four foot painting of Radha Krishna from the cover of his Srimad Bhagavatam. Then he had me paint a great big four foot by three foot painting of him sitting on the Vyasasana with a painting of Lord Chaitanya dancing in Sankirtan party hanging behind him. In the, in the picture that I painted, and specifically with Lord Chaitanya's foot touching his head. So 
those are the paintings that he started this on. And what I find so significant is in this is that Srila Prabhupada engaged people in the work for which they had a natural propensity. He always found, and this gave the person a taste for devotional service because they already had that inclination. In the course of the morning walk, uh, I'd have to say that in my mind throughout the walk, I was scheming, how is it that I could get up front? I just, that's all I could think about. And uh, I, I'd be constantly scheming how to maneuver myself in a situation where I could, you know, get there and, and say something maybe, because I felt that I'd never get this opportunity again. I really strongly felt that. Uh, in the course of the walk, there was one devotee that was asking Prabhupada a lot of questions. And uh, very intimate questions of Radha and Krishna pastimes and the gopis. Prabhupada answered, but he wasn't very, it wasn't very exciting. It wasn't enlivening. You know, Prabhupada, he would answer the question, but then he wouldn't say much. And he would just, you know, continue chanting his japa. And this devotee was very persistent in his questioning. And Prabhupada was very nice. He didn't say, you know, he, he didn't exhibit any, you know, anger or anything of that nature. But it didn't seem like it was very exciting, like what I thought a morning walk was going to be like, you know, very exciting and powerful and, you know, a lot of nice Krishna conscious nectar, although that was nectar, but it just didn't seem like Srila Prabhupada was really absorbed in it. So um, the morning walk that day wasn't very far. It wasn't a very long distance that Prabhupada walked. It was like maybe a big parking lot, I believe, if I can recall properly. And uh, we walked and, you know, you got to the end of the, uh, the park and there was a, you know, a row of trees there. You turned around and then kind of came back. So we came to that particular point to turn around, and I became very, very nervous because I thought that I only had so much time left to be able to approach Srila Prabhupada and, and say something. So throughout the whole uh, walk back, as I was you know, scheming, you know, how am I going to do this? I was trying to develop enough nerve and courage to get there. So uh, finally, I just made up my mind. I thought, I got to do this. I just, I cannot, you know, you know, hesitate. I'll never get this opportunity again. So I really built myself up in, you know, with courage and determination, and I zipped through all the sannyasis, a pretty good, pretty good quantity of them. So I kind of zigzagged through the crowd, and of course, you know, trying to get through the crowd, I had to exert a certain amount of energy. Uh, the excitement of doing that, you know, the fear of offending Prabhupada, the, the fear of not saying anything that would be significant, you know, uh, that would even be, you know, noticeable was all, yeah, so all these emotions were in there, you know, and so obviously uh, when I ran through the crowd, I was so excited that practically, you know, at the top of my voice, I would say, I, I yelled out, Srila Prabhupada! And it was so startling that Prabhupada just stopped, you know, right in the middle of the, you know, the street there, and all the devotees are just, became, you know, paralyzed. They didn't know what was going on. It's thought it was some crazy thing or crazy guy. So everybody stopped, Prabhupada stopped, and he looked at me, and I just, you know, out of complete anxiety, just started saying all kinds of stuff. You know, Srila Prabhupada, we just want to please you. You know, we're distributing books at O'Hare Airport. You know, and then I started telling how many books are being distributed and how we're doing it. And, you know, I just want to make sure I threw in everything. I didn't want to miss it, so, so I said everything I could say, you know, and, and, you know, I just kept saying over and over, we just want to please you, Shira Prabhupada, and, you know, this is for you, and, uh, you know, just, just all kinds of statistics, statistics of devotees doing books there. And, and Shira Prabhupada just, you know, looked at me throughout the whole thing, and I'm sure it wasn't very long, you know, I'm sure it was just a matter of seconds, but, you know, it meant like minutes to me, and my throat became like really choked up, I couldn't talk anymore, and, uh, you know, I just became, my mouth became dry. I recall at one point that I just, all I could hear was my heart, you know, beating immensely. I mean, just fast and, God, I just, I just more or less said everything and then I was just finished. <laughs> I just kind of like stood there before Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, you know, he was very merciful. He was very kind and he was very peaceful and calm because he could see I was very excited and, you know, and Prabhupada was very calming, and he said, thank you very much. He said, thank you. 
And then what was really shocking at that particular point was Prabhupada in a very calm, you know, demeanor, very, very wonderful, and, and just trying to encourage me. He turned around and looked at all the devotees that were on the morning walk. He just faced them. And he said, just see, this is my real devotee. And he was referring, of course, to book distribution. So that was very meaningful for me. I think on that particular day, I, I didn't realize at that particular time what that was, because I was just overwhelmed with so many emotions. But I do recall that after the morning walk, and going back and just trying to think about what actually happened there, uh, it really uh, it meant my life. That was my life after that, I felt. I felt this was an instruction from Srila Prabhupada. It was to me, I felt, you know, although I'm sure he was referring to more than just me, but I felt that it was something that Srila Prabhupada was telling me, and it meant uh, everything for me. So even up to this point, uh, so many years later, I consider that to be the most important, uh, you know, instruction or event in my life in Krishna consciousness. Another very significant thing happened in Boston. Swamiji became Srila Prabhupada. The way this happened was that Gorsinder was studying Hindi and he was studying Sanskrit and he was studying various forms of address and G is an affectionate friendship form of uh, address and this is all very new to us. So uh, I was sitting in Srila Prabhupada's room and taking dictation as I often did and Gorsinder was at the doorway and he said, uh, Swamiji, uh, is it okay if I call Govinda Dasi Govindaji? And Prabhupada, Swamiji said, uh, no, G is a very third class form of address should not. And so I said, well, then why are we calling you Swamiji if it's a third class form of address? And he said, well, not very important. I said, no, it is very important. We want to know what is the best thing we can call you. And Swamiji said, well, you could call me Gurudev or Guru Maharaj or Srila Prabhupada. And I said, well, which one is the best of those three? If you give me three, I don't know which one. So you pick the best one that you want to be called. And Swamiji said, Srila Prabhupada is nice. I said, okay, from today you will be called Srila Prabhupada. And so I told all the devotees and everyone started calling him Srila Prabhupada from that day. He was no longer Swamiji. When I arrived in Mayapur, it was just before the festival, and um, I had just come from Brazil. Uh, we just opened the temple there and the BBT, and I was a young brahmachari and young. <laughs> and I, in those days, uh, to when you're a brahmachari and you're preaching and opening centers, uh, sometimes you know you 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 get distracted and what you want to do uh I, I i had i wanted to become a sannyasi i don't know if it was because of the maha prasadam or not really because i was kind of getting that anyways <laughs> but um i i wanted to do it i think because like everyone else you want to you want to grow and 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 get more prominent so Prabhupada will see you and, and i think you know, that was why everybody wanted it. Um, unfortunately, in my case, um, there were other things that I wanted beneath the surface as well. But at that time, I was, I was on the list to, to be recommended for sannyas that year. And I was going to Mayapur. I was going with Sri Dainanda Maharaj. And, uh, and when we arrived in Mayapur, it was the first time I'd ever been to India. And I, I remember sitting down in the Prashadam Hall and just looking at how incredible this place was. You know, how huge and how beautiful. And just, you know, its presence and its power was just a... Uh, and I thought to myself, um, I think I said it out loud, which was the mistake <laughs> in Mayapur. I said, boy, would I love to manage this place. And Jaya Pataka Maharaj was sitting next to me, and I w wasn't aware of even who he was at the time. 
And I know, and, and then that evening, uh, I got called into Prabhupada's room. Now, in Mayapur, on the first floor, Prabhupada stayed on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, the sannyasis and GVC stayed. And I stayed in one of those rooms with Tamal Maharaj, uh, Sridhananda Maharaj, I think Jagadish Prabhu was there, and um, I was taking care of them, and I was staying in the room. And it was late in the night, and uh, Hari Sori Prabhu came in and said, Prabhupada, you know, or some would like to see you. So I went in, and when I went in the room, there was Sridhananda Maharaj, Jayapataka Maharaj, and Srila Prabhupada. And so Prabhupada said to me, so you'd like to stay here? And I was, I was, first I was just overwhelmed that a question was even being directed at me. And uh, I, said, I said yes. Um, and uh, so they talked about it a bit. Prabhupada had, had said to me that he wanted uh, Bhavananda to travel on a boat that they had recently acquired up and down the Ganges preaching that Jayapataka Maharaj, he wanted him to preach to important politicians and important Indians, and they would need help in the management in Mayapur. And being that I was a Canadian, which in those days I think helped visa-wise, and that I was a manager, um, I, I, I was being targeted to, to stay and help in Mayapur. And I was thinking, what will Brazil do? <laughs> you know, after I walked out of the room, it hit me. I'm not in Brazil anymore. And in Brazil, I was kind of like, I was on my own. I was the big, you know, honcho. Uh, and and I, it started to actually weigh on me what I just said yes to. And, and so it got really heavy. <laughs> it, it got heavier and heavier to the point where I, I changed my mind. And I, I went to, I think, I can't remember how many times I went back in and asked Prabhupada if I could go back to Brazil and, and how many times it kind of went back and forth. I think the first time maybe even Hridai Nanda Maharaj went in and said something and then Prabhupada had agreed and he came out and said, okay, you don't have to stay, you can go back. But then that night I got asked back into his room again. So Prabhupada looked at me and he said, so have you made your mind up yet? And I, I, th I was under the impression I was already, lip, you know, released. <laughs> and I just said, so he says, do you want to stay? So I, I couldn't say no. I, I, I couldn't say no to him. I, you know, I just, I, I knew it was a no-no, you know, that you gotta, you're supposed to do what he asked you to do. So I kept saying yes. And then I'd walk out of the room, and then it would hit me again. And I'd just get over, and the whole, every day was this constant, and at nighttime, I, and then I started going back in and saying, Srila Prabhupada, I don't know what they're going to do in Brazil. There's a BBT, the temples. No one has any experience. I'm the only devotee there who's had any experience with the movement. There's 40, 50 people there already. Um, you know, there's, and, and so um, I need to go back. And he, he wouldn't budge. Um, I guess he had plans for someone else to go and take care of it already. And he... Uh, he kept, and kept insisting, you know, that I stay. And every time he would call me back in, um, he would ask me if I would stay, and I'd say yes, and I'd go back out completely overwhelmed, come back and ask if I could leave. He'd say okay. That night he'd call me back in again, ask me again if I'd made my mind up. Yet so finally on, 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 on one day during his massage, uh, I went up to his room and uh, had, had asked him, you know, could I go back? And he said, he was sitting having his massage, Hari Sori Prabhu was there, and he turned to me and, uh, you know, just so kind, he said, in the spiritual world, we all have different relationships with Krishna. So, you know, it's okay. You know, you can go back to Brazil. We were at New Jersey in the spring of 1968, after Srila Prabhupada's stroke. We were living there for three weeks. It was at that time that Gorsundar received his call to the draft. So he had to have an appointment in New York for, and it was a very great likelihood that he would be drafted into the army. Naturally, we were in a lot of anxiety about this because Gorsundar didn't want to fight a war that he didn't believe in and that Srila Prabhupada also did not support. So the day came for Gorsundar to go for his draft appointment in New York. And 
he was in anxiety, and as he bowed down to leave, Swamiji said to him, don't worry, Krishna will protect you. He will take care of everything. So he was gone the whole day by train to New York. And I know during the day, Srila Prabhupada mentioned him several times, so he was thinking of him. Then in the evening, we heard him coming up the stairs, and he had a big smile on his face. He was very happy. And so as soon as he came in, Swamiji called him to his room. What happened? And he explained that he had a silken cord with the Lord Jagannath on, on his neck, a murti of Lord Jagannath, about three inches high. And he also had a, uh, his big red chanting beads. And the, the doctors there had never seen such odd things. So they uh, had given him a three Y based on uh, not being a psychiatric uh, competent, psychiatrically competent for the army. And so Srila Prabhupada said, yes, just see, Krishna will protect. If we are sincere, he will make all arrangements. He will protect us. And you have chosen Krishna's service, not the army service. So Krishna has arranged everything perfectly. So I was in L.A. That was, and uh, I started telling President in L.A. And then Prabhupada came to L.A., I don't know, maybe after Rathiatra that year, that was 1974. So this is, so Prabhupada comes and of course I'm the TP, so I get to go in the morning walks, I get to go in the garden and everything. So Prabhupada had just been there, just gotten there, and we were having one of those evening kind of things in the, you know, the little, the little garden back in, in L.A. And, uh, there was quite a few devotees all sitting around, and I was kind of, Jayatirtha was by Prabhupada, and I'd just come in, and Jayatirtha goes, Prabhupada, I'd like to introduce you to our new temple president here in L.A., Tulsi Das. So, uh, so, so Prabhupada <laughs> looks at me, and he goes, oh, I know Tulsi Das. So my heart, I'm going, oh, great, <laughs> Prabhupada knows me. <laughs> Prabhupada really <laughs> recognizes me. I thought was, you know, this is happening in a nanosecond, but I'm really feeling, you know, like really good. So, you know, I know Tulsi Das. Then he goes, and, and, and why did you leave Bombay? So I went from like this way up here to like, I mean, just, I mean, I just went crashing to the bottom and, and I, my mind was just trying to find what am I going to say? And my, I was, my heart was beating up, and I was going, and I started to make some excuses. Well, I was having some trouble with the management, or I was doing this or that, and finally I just went. I looked at Prabhupada, straight in Prabhupada's eyes, and I said, "Srila Prabhupada, I was in Maya," and Prabhupada said, "Yes." <laughs> And then he went on to give this whole lecture about, you know, how powerful Maya is and everything. But it was, it was a, it was a highlight moment for me that, uh, that uh, moment in the garden in L.A. And this was at the time when uh, he was visiting Hawaii, and at that time there were uh, several disciples uh, who had become, who were very, by nature, very intelligent and charismatic and had misled some of the more simple folk, simple-minded devotees. And I was uh, in a lot of anxiety about it because I uh, felt extremely protective of the devotees, having been the first devotee in Hawaii. They were like my children, sort of. So I was very protective and I was very, ang I was very anxious about it. So I was explaining to Prabhupada how such and such these people are uh, they were misleading him in this way and in that way and changing the philosophy and so forth. And Prabhupada very calmly looked at me and said, the cat, the mouse respects the cat and the cat respects the dog. The dog respects the wolf and the wolf respects the tiger. But we see they are all animals. In other words, from his perspective, all of us, all of these people that he's having to deal with on this planet are really on the level of animals. And if we realize that, we won't get too puffed up. If we realize that we're really coming from very, very 
low-grade backgrounds. He's coming from Krishna Loka. There's no chance of our getting so puffed up that we think that we can outguess him, uh, edit him, change his uh, uh, ideas about things, uh, think we could do better. It's impossible. We can't. He can outguess. I mean, I've, I saw so many instances of this. Unfortunately, one very close to home instance was my own husband, who I loved very much, Gorsundar. He was brilliant. He was very educated. He was studying Sanskrit and Bengali. And he did the transliteration for Chaitanya Charita, Charitamrita, the first part of it. And he was, um, he was a very nice devotee. He used to take Prabhupada on walks every day. And he do, did the massage every day. Uh, I give him all credit for all the wonderful service that he did. Uh, but later on, he uh, left, and uh, Prabhupada made the comment to me, even though he knew I was quite attached, many times he said, Gorsundar is suffering from too much intelligence. He has the disease of being too intelligent. He thinks he knows more than his guru. And this was Gorsundar's flaw. He was very, very uh, brilliant in every respect. But as soon as a person thinks they know more than their guru, then the fall down begins. Early, around 70, 72, I'd been preparing for sannyas for about, no, no, it was later than that, what was it? Anyway, it was early, early 70s, I'm not sure of the date, but I'd been preparing for sannyas, and Srila Prabhupada was, you know, he was treating me very special. We'd go on the morning walk, I got to go on all the morning walks, and he would give me special attention and talk to me. And um, <clears throat> I remember one day, as I, I was on the morning walk with him, and it, as I'm looking at him, his skin looked like silk. It was like he revealed an energy to me, but his skin went from being flesh to being just golden silk. It was very beautiful. Um, and I got myself all prepared and, you know, shaved up and fresh cloth. And I went to Shamsunda and I said, Shamsunda, I'd like to see, ask Srila Prabhupada, see Srila Prabhupada. And he said, well, why, why do you want to see Srila Prabhupada? And this is when Shamsun had just been made GBC. So I said, well, I want to ask him for sannyas. And he said, well, Kula Shekha. He said, don't, he said, you really think you want to take sannyas? And I said, yeah, I've, I've been preparing for it for years and I'm, I'm very ready. So Shamsun said, well, do you ever think of marriage? I said, yeah, well, you know, he said, do you ever think of sex? Do you ever think of marriage? You ever, you ever? I said, well, sometimes the thought crossed my mind. I said, well, I don't pay any attention to it. So he said, well, look, Kulashek, I said, maybe you should get married. I said, what? He said, yeah, he said, maybe you should get married. He said, look, this is a big decision. He said, this is for the rest of your life. He said, go away and think about it. He said, because if you ever think of sex, you shouldn't take sannyas. So I went away and thought about it <laughs> that night, <laughs> all night long. <laughs> Didn't sleep much that night, I remember. And of course, trying to be truthful with myself, I thought, well, you know, sometimes I do think of sex life, and it does cross my mind, and maybe I'm being just totally, you know, false. I, I, should, I should probably get married. Well, then I started thinking, well, who do I want to marry? <laughs> so I started thinking about all the different Brahmacharinis and which one was the best one to, for me to marry. And uh, Anyway, I'd already gone through the complete ceremony, more or less. And, uh, so I went back to Shamsun the next morning and I said, Shamsun, I said, I think, I think you're right, probably. I think I should probably get married. He said, well, you know, 
who, who do you want to marry? And I told him the name of the girl. And he said, oh, that's a good choice. Yeah, he said, he said you, can, you can go in and see Srila Prabhupada. He said, just knock on the door. So I said, great. So I knocked on the door and I opened the door, came in, and Prabhupada was beaming at me, beaming. And I paid obeisances, and I got up and I sat there, and Prabhupada said, yes. I said, Srila Prabhupada, I'd like to get married. And he went, what? What? He said, who has done this to you? <laughs> and I was devastated. He said, who has done this to you? And I said, well, Prabhupada, I, I went to see Sham Sunni, and he went, Sham Sunda! And he looked at Pradumna, and he pointed, he said, Pradumna, he said, get Sham Sunda in here immediately. Prabhupada was furious. When I sat there, I felt like a dog. I was looking at the floor, and I was like devastated. So Sham Sunda comes in and sits down. And Prabhupada said, Who are you to tell my Brahmachari to get married? Who are you? And Sham Sunda said, Well, Prabhupada, he said he wanted to take sannyas. And I told him, if he ever thinks of sex life, Prabhupada said, Everyone with a material body thinks of sex life. He said, look at him. He's, he's, he's finished. And Prabhupada looked at me with such compassion. He said, look at him. He's finished. He said, you have no right to tell my Brahma choice to get married, ever. That was, I don't remember much after that. I I'd, I'd kind of been wanting to get married for some time. Actually in LA pew, you know, but some things it never worked out in LA. Anyhow, so at that time Prabhupada was practically giving sannyas it seemed like to everybody, you know, people that I you know just he seemed like a kind of like a mercy gift, you know, like gurudas. Not not that I'm saying anything bad, but he was like giving all these people. So, although in my heart I didn't really buy into it, uh, between Rameshwar, mainly Rameshwar, <laughs> and maybe Gopa Vrinda Paul or a couple others, they were convincing me, you should take sannyas, you should take sannyas. So we were in this kind of darshan with Prabhupada. There were probably 30 devotees. I was probably mm, 15 feet back from Prabhupada. Jayatirtha was right beside me. Rameshwar was standing behind Prabhupada. And so he's standing behind him. It was kind of a lull in the discussion. And, and Rameshwar catches my eyes and he goes, <laughs> so, I know what he means. So I kind of stammer, Srila uh, uh, Prabhupada? He goes, yes. Um, uh, I don't know. I've been talking with some of the devotees and, and I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but... Um, it, it, there's a thought that maybe it'd be a good move or a good thing for me to take sannyas. So Prabhupada said, um, well, how long have you been a brahmachari? And I said, five years. And he said, oh, very nice. And, uh, and then he said, what about the fire? Or he said, what about the butter? He said, either one of those things. I think, let's just say he said, what about the, what about the butter? And I was kind of going, what about the butter? <laughs> I'm going, and Jayatirtha whispers to me, he goes, you know, the women, fire, butter. <laughs> so instead of being truthful with Prabhupada and saying, listen, Prabhupada, I really, I'm kind of, I'd really like to have some, you know, some uh, female uh, uh, association and all that goes with it. I said, Prabhupada, as long as I'm traveling and preaching, everything is fine. That's a little bit of a thing. So Prabhupada said, okay, so you can take sannyas. So I said, oh, so should uh, that we bring my name up then at this Mayapur and then I wait a year? And he says, no, you take this year. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> oh, what am I going to do? So I go, I get, I'm, really a, I'm really at a, you know, kind of like, I've, he's already told me I'm going to take sannyas. This is like in six, you know, in a few months' time. 
So I'm looking around for like, well, what am I going to do? Because I don't vision myself like any of these other sannyasis. So at this same time, Prabhupada, I think, went to Hawaii after leaving LA, and they had that boat there that they wanted, to, but nobody could skip it or anything. And I love the water. My sun and moon are in Pisces. I've always lived on the water. I just love the water, and I thought, ooh, this is a nice idea. So I wrote up a whole proposal of like a traveling Sankirtan party on a boat. And I'd even gone and seen this schooner, this big Gloucester schooner, 120 foot, and the guy was going to train us on how to do it. And we had a whole program, and Rameshwar was behind it for book distribution. And because I knew I had, I better find something to do if I'm going to take sannyas, because I'm not just going to go and round the temples and give lectures, or that's. I was a manager. So I could see me managing the boat and on the boat and, you know, coming into the town and it would have been fun. And it seemed like it was something Prabhupada wanted. So I wrote him this whole big thing about my idea and, and, and preaching with the boat. And, and he wrote back this little short paragraph, why waste time, why waste time uh, sailing, better to fly instead. <laughs> so I took, okay, I got it. Anyhow, uh, Rameshwar really liked the idea. He really, really, really liked the idea because I think it was the heyday of book distribution and the Sankirtan. This would be connected with the L.A. temple, so it'd be another feather in the L.A. temple growing, you know, empire there, which we, you know, it was big. Everything was there at that time, practically. Fate was there and, uh, and uh, all the artists and all that kind of thing. Anyhow, so... I took it fine. The Prabhupada said, you know, all right, what am I going to do? I still got sannyas looking at me. So anyhow, in some long distance calls between Rameshwar and Harikesh, Prabhupada was in Bombay translating. Rameshwar is talking to Harikesh and he's trying to get Harikesh to bring this idea up again. That, uh, that uh, this is a good idea and the boat and everything. And da, da, da. So anyhow, I guess Harikesh did me a real favor. And uh, when he was explaining to Prabhupada, I guess, about the boat, and, you know, like maybe Prabhupada, I don't know what happened because nobody would tell me, but uh, um, Prabhupada asked, well, why, why is he so anxious for doing this? I wasn't anxious for doing it, but Prabhupada asked that. So I think Hari K said something like, well, Prabhupada, you know, he's in LA and there's all these women around and, uh, you know, he's agitated or whatever, and this would be a good way, he'll always be out. And anyhow, so Prabhupada writes this scathing letter, didn't even write it to me, he writes it to, pra to Rameshwar, who wouldn't even show it to me for years. I've got a copy of the letter now. And it's in it, Prabhupada just, uh, he, he, he just saved me. He, he said, what a, you know, uh, rascal, lowest of mankind, fool, you know, bad example, taking sannyas, all this kind of stuff. And Rameshwar was so afraid that I'd freak out if I saw it, he wouldn't even show it to me. He had Jayatir to break the news to me in a gentle way. But the minute I heard that Prabhupada had said that basically I couldn't take sannyas, I, I just felt saved. So I was duplicitous with, with my spiritual master. I, I was, you know, when I, in Laguna Beach, when I told him, as long as I'm traveling and preaching, then I'm fine. And by his grace, he straightened it out. And the minute that letter came, in the core of my being, I was so thankful. I was just, I was relieved because I, 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 I had done something stupid. I did stupid the first thing, I'd asked to take sannyas. <laughs> <laughs> and the second stupid thing was not being just straightforward with Prabhupada. If I'd have said, Prabhupada, well, I, I'm really, you know, not really thinking I'm sannyas material, but this has come up, and I really would like to get married and have a really nice wife, he'd have probably, I would imagine, instructed me down those lines. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't, but I didn't give him the chance to, I didn't give him the information to... Uh, to kind of uh, give me the instruction. As they were leaving, she said, should we leave too, Srila Prabhupada? And he said, um, uh, 
uh, not unless you have some questions. And we both go, no, we don't have any questions. We both offer obeisances at the same time. Actually, we did have questions. <laughs> so as we both get up from paying obeisances, we simultaneously start asking questions. <laughs> anyway, I let her go first. She asked a question. She said, Srila Prabhupada, I heard that in yesterday's darshan, uh, you said that a sannyasi's business is to preach. Brahmacharya's business is to assist the sannyasis. And the householder, the grihasta's business, is to, to do deity worship. So what about us brahmacharinis? Can we do deity worship? And actually, we were doing a lot of deity worship. We were doing most of the deity worship in Bombay at the time, for Radharas Bihari, in the old temple. And he said, yes, you can also do deity worship. So she was satisfied with her answer. So then I asked my question. This is uh, a question I had been thinking for a long time. And what I wanted to ask and what I did ask were two different things. I had heard from a friend, Chintamani Prabhu, that he had given her instructions to worship Lord Jagannath because her husband was Sudama and he had taken sannyas. And there was a deity of Lord Jagannath in Japan. I believe they were installed, but they were her deities. He told her on two different occasions to make Jagannath your husband, Subhadra your daughter, and Balaram your son. It's a very personal instruction. And then an, I also knew from Nandalal Prabhu that he had given her a deity of Krishna right off his desk. He had given her a deity and told her to worship his feet. I think it was a silver deity of, of Lord Krishna that someone had given him and it was on his desk in, in Los Angeles. So I knew about these two ladies and they were both in a renounced position. One, the husband took sannyasi, the other was older and didn't want to get married. And I was thinking, I was very old. I was 29. <laughs> and I was thinking I was very old and I wasn't going to get married. And so I was thinking, I was like them and I wanted instruction like them. But yet I didn't really have that close of personal relationship with Prabhupada. So I didn't, I wanted to ask, can I have my own deity? And I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I had to say, Srila Prabhupada, can devotees have their own deities? And his answer was, no. And then he said, because they, that will distract from the temple deity. So I took that instruction to mean that if you're going to get absorbed in your own deity worship, then you don't want to take the time to worship the temple deity. And that, that was the main lesson. One incident took place with me and Srila Prabhupada, and this was in Los Angeles in September of 1968. We were going to record the record album, the Govinda record album. And so uh, early in the morning, he, he wanted to use his spiritual master's uh, preface to Brahma Samhita, uh, the materialistic demeanor, Mist demeanor cannot stretch to the transcendental, you know the one I'm talking about. Anyway, he wanted to use that, so he asked me to type it up. I think he wrote it out or something and asked me to. So I typed it up, typewriter, you know, we use typewriters and others. And uh, he read it to me a couple of times to practice because we were going to the recording studio around 9 in the morning, 9 or 10, fairly early. And we were going to record this, um, this talk and the Govinda record. The, I think it's called the Govinda record, right? You know the one I mean. So he read it to me. and. I listened very carefully. He wanted, he would read things to me and see how does this sound, he, you know, just because I was a new English, you know, fairly well. And so he read it to me and there was one word that he pronounced differently from what is customarily pronounced in the English language. That word is analogously. And so I never corrected Srila Prabhupada before. In fact, I loved it that he called watermelons water lemons. When he would ask me for water lemon, I never said, oh, Prabhupada, that's called watermelon. And when he called for some antelope, I never told him that's called cantaloupe. I was fine with that. I had a very motherly relationship with Prabhupada. I loved, uh, I thought he was just a, whatever he said was wonderful. You know, if the sky was striped pink, green, and orange, fine. But because I was thinking 
that other people are going to hear this, and this is for all posterity, and they may not understand his accent, uh, and he's pronouncing this word analogously, and they may not understand what that means. So I had very good intentions. I was, my intentions were very innocent. I was not on any kind of ego trip. I was simply that thinking, oh, you want your, your, your guru to become the best foot forward type thing, you know. So I said, um, Srila Prabhupada, I think that word um, is pronounced analogously. He looked at me and said, you pronounce it your way and I'll pronounce it my way. I probably got the most severe chastising of my life, um, <laughs> which till today helps me. Um, it, 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 I, I feel at that time is where I really made contact with Srila Prabhupada as my father. Um, uh, I, was, I was watching the other day, you were showing the tapes, and uh, Guru Kripa Prabhu was expressing how he got chastised and how Prabhupada sent him out of the room like a kid. Boy, could I relate to that. <laughs> um, I, I, I was in Mayapur. It was during this time, and I think it was right after the first day that he had asked me to uh, help the management. So I really didn't get any instruction from anybody on, on what to do or where to go, so I just immediately took charge, which is so I, I, I set up my little office in a corner somewhere they gave me, immediately went out and started doing what I thought is what I do, right? What I was doing was changing everything he had done. <laughs> and I was changing the cleanup, and I was changing, you know, I was just out there creating havoc. And uh, he came back on that morning walk, and he went into the room, into the temple room, to Guru Puj, and the floors were wet because I had changed everything, and so the system wasn't working. And I was somewhere upstairs, I think maybe changing something else, and uh, I was, he was going up the stairs uh, to his room, and I was starting to come down the stairs, and I had this big smile on my face, and I was expecting some kind of, you know, glorification or something, and he put a point at his cane at me, and he looked at me, and he said, who do you think you are? You're the king? And he started just chastising me. And I, 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 had, a, I had an out-of-body experience um, out of embarrassment because it was just a few days before the Mayapur festival. Everybody was in town. All the older, you know, uh, devotees who, you know, I always look up to as, you know, your, the old, your older god brothers, and, and, and I was just so embarrassed, and they were all standing there looking at me too. I didn't know where to go, so I just went up to a cloud, <laughs> was watching the conversation. Um, I, was, I was just a, you know, young, and I had been doing something I shouldn't have been doing and got chastised by him, and, and I took it hard. Um, I remember I went back to the room, and, and it's, it's quite a long time ago, and I don't remember exactly the sequences of it, but I practically became physically ill in, in, in the sense that I think it was just embarrassment and didn't want to go out in public. And I remember I was laying in bed and it was the next day or, and there was a guru puj going on. And uh, oh, I, rem I remember one, one thing. Um, I, w I was in the washroom one day and Sudama Maharaj came in and uh, he said to me, because there was this morning walk and, and I was always up there on that morning walk with him on the roof, getting a rose, taking off the, you know, the, uh, the, the thorns on the side, cleaning it for him every morning, you know, butting in front of the sannyasis, you know, just, I think I was agitating people too, because I was really, you know, trying to be there and, and, and just being on that morning walk. So I, I stopped showing up on the morning walk. And I think the first morning Prabhupada said, where's Mr. Brazil? <laughs> And then he started chastising me again when I wasn't there. Oh, he thinks he's the king. And, 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 and Sudama Maharaj was telling me this in the bathroom. He says, boy, are you getting the mercy? And I, and I was thinking, mercy? <laughs> Man, I am getting, you know, I'm just waiting for Krishna to breathe me back inside again. You know, I, I, it was like it was over for me. You know, what, what, you know, I'm at rock bottom, you know. I'm, 
you know, you, you came there, you want to do something, you've been preaching, opening centers, and you come and you want the guru to be happy with you, and I am literally getting yelled at worse than my dad used to do, you know, in front of everything dear to me in the universe, you know. And, and it, was, it was hard, and, and so I was, I, I was at, literally laying in bed in, the, in that room down the hall from him, Guru Puja was going on downstairs, and or I heard the de you know the, greeting the deities, and then Hari Sori Prabhu shows up in the, in the room. He goes, "Prabhupada wants you at Guru Puja," and then I thought, "Oh no!" It, it, I thought it couldn't get any worse, and 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 I, now 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 I have him, you know, looking for me in the building, you know, and I'm thinking, what you know, I I, I, I just didn't know what to think, I'll, but I got ready and went down to the I did what I was told. It, Immediately took a sh quick shower, got my dhoti on, went down to the temple room, and Guru Puja just started, right? And and I hid behind Guru Das, who was, you know, a good size then. And it was at the back, and the temple room was full. And Guru Kripa Prabhu, I remember, he grabbed the Murdanga, and he was just going to start leading Guru Puja. And he, he had just, just hit the drum in Sri Guru, and I heard Prabhupada stopped the kirtan, right? And then, you know, the devotees, it like opened up. And there was this direct channel between me and Srila Prabhupada. And, and he pointed at me and he said to Guru Kripa, let him lead. He likes the chant. And so, I mean, at that moment, you know, I mean, I just melted, you know. And, and that was a very emotional morning program for me. So I, uh, I think it was the next day that I went up to his room and, and um, asked if I could go back to Brazil. And that's when he, he let me go. And during this time, and, and, and during these conversations that I had had with him in the evenings, he had said to me, you should be in India. It's, go it's good for you here. And that one funny thing he said to me was, because um, he knew I was young and passionate, and oh yeah, the sannyasi thing, that, uh, that ended real quick. I mean, I think the first thing he said to me when I got to Mayapur, so you want to take sannyas or do you want to get married? So I, I knew he knew, <laughs> and at that moment I'd already resigned <laughs> from the idea. In another time, <clears throat> I was alone with Srila Prabhupada ask, talking to him about marriage. It was the day after that Sanyas incident, and um, he let me come in and have private darshan, and he wanted to talk to me about the system of marriage. Yeah, well, I asked him, I said, Prabhupada, can you tell me about married life? And he said, he said, when the, the girl is eight, she is betrothed to a husband, uh, and the family has already worked everything out. They come from the same social strata, astrological compatibility, everything's worked out. He said then from 8 till 12, 14, she would go every day to the, her husband's house and his mother would train her on how to look, take care of her son, the way he liked his food cooked, etc., etc. He said then as soon as she attained puberty, they would have sex life. He said and she would never look at another man the rest of her life. He said, that is marriage. He said, anything else, I do not know. <laughs> we were in Hawaii at the Honolulu Temple, and I was doing making deities. And he had spent a great deal of time explaining how he wanted the Gordon Thai deities made. And there was a devotee sculptor there, one of his disciples who is a sculptor. And he gave us elaborate instructions of what to do. And after all of his elaborate instructions, the sculptor devotee asked, my wife would like to make uh, silk. But in order to make silk, you have to kill the silkworms. So is this OK? And uh, so Srila Prabhupada, I don't actually recall what he said about the silk. Uh, but after this devotee left, he, was, he expressed that he was annoyed because that he was giving one instruction and next uh, uh, instead there was a talk of making silk and 
He said, these, are mess these Western d disciples, they are so creative. Next, they will be asking me if they can kill cows to make medunyas. There was a, one, one morning the devotees were complaining to me about the diet and that they wanted more fruit and more, these were the American, European, you know, the, the, the Westerners. And they were, they were saying, look, you know, because the diet in Vrindavan at the time was japatis and kitri in the morning, and at lunch it was japati, dal, rice, and I think a sabji. So they were thinking, look, we're, all we're getting, you know, we need to get some fruit and some other things. So, so, but you don't, I had already learned you don't change anything to start, right? <laughs> I wasn't going there. I wasn't ruining a good thing. <laughs> um, and so I went to Prabhupada, and I said, uh, Srila Prabhupada, the devotees are requesting that, you know, we, 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 we have, they want some fruit and some other things in the diet. He says, Prabhupada said to me, we're grain eaters. He said, humans are grain eaters. If they want to eat fruit, then that's all they should eat. So don't change it. So I didn't, I didn't, that was as far as that went. We're grain eaters. I, I was happy because I just loved, the japatis and kitri in Vrindavan were the best. You know, you had fresh, hot japatis, just a little burnt, and, 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 and the kitri was, it just, it was, the prashadam was delicious in, in Vrindavan. Srila so Prabhupada gave classes each morning in the Frederick Street Temple and would always ask for questions at the end of the class. But he wanted questions that were relevant. One morning, I wanted to hear the story of Lord Chaitanya falling in the water. It wasn't really relevant to the class, so I was kind of shy about asking it. But anyway, I raised my hand and I asked. I said, well, this isn't really relevant, but could you please tell the story about Lord Chaitanya falling into the water? And Prabhupada went into ecstasy. I didn't know what was going on. He became totally quiet for about five minutes. And I was, I was like, oh gosh, what have I done wrong now? I was really worried. And then he came out and he said, yes. <clears throat> and he told the story of Lord Chaitanya falling in the water. And afterwards, all the devotees were saying, didn't you see there were tears running down his face? Tears were coming down, and he was, he was completely in ecstasy. And I, I, I marveled on that, and I began to see that here he's in the Western world, and Western children, we were just like children to him, were asking him about Lord Chaitanya, and it gave him great pleasure, it gave him great joy. Now, from the ride from L.A. to Laguna Beach, Jaya Tirtha drove with Prabhupada. Prabhupada and maybe, I don't know who else was in the car. I wasn't in the car going to Laguna Beach. Anyhow, Jaya Tirtha was falling asleep the whole way. And Prabhupada wasn't going to let him drive from Laguna Beach to San Diego. <laughs> no way. So Jaya Tirtha approaches me that I should drive the car with Prabhupada. I think it was a Mercedes. Anyhow, so I was like, really feeling this is uh, this is really great and I was feeling like really yeah this is really great this is a, a rare opportunity I was going to be in the car but just Jayatirtha and I think maybe it was Brahmananda or maybe it was Tamal Krishna Goswami anyhow um, can't remember but in those days we hardly slept I mean to stay awake in Bhagavatam class I know the only way I, I, I ever stayed awake is I exercised my temple president privilege and fanned Prabhupada the whole time so I could stay. <laughs> that, was my, that was how I did it. So anyhow, so I was just as tired as everybody else. We were on the road. And so we're traveling, in a, and it's not far from Laguna Beach, San Diego, about an hour's drive. And my eyes are like, oh, you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah. and I can't open the window or anything. So anyhow, so I'm looking in the mirror, and, and I'm looking in there, and Prabhupada's got his head back, and then Prabhupada's asleep. <laughs> and a little bit later, I look in the mirror, and who else was sitting in the back seat with Prabhupada? I think it was Brahmananda. He was asleep. And then a little bit later, I look over to Jayatirtha, who was riding. 
in the shotgun seat, and he's asleep. So I'm the only one awake in the whole car. <laughs> and I'm going like this, and I hold your eyes, and I'm, uh, and I'm just dying to fall asleep. <laughs> and I can't roll down the window. I can't turn on the radio. I can't chant Jop aloud or anything. So I'm just like struggling and struggling with this whole thing. And I'm, I, and I'm, I'm there because Prabhupada wanted to feel safe. And I'm doing this. And then I hear from the back in the seat of the car. And Prabhupada starts the kirtan. And, and then just everybody in the car gradually wakes up. And we had this really wonderful, just the four of us in the car, this kirtan on the way to San Diego. He's <laughs> saying we had to probably fall asleep and killed us all. <laughs> But just at the, like like at the darkest hour of when my eyes just wouldn't I just I just this soft clapping started in the back and he started a kirtan. <laughs> when Prabhupada arrived in London one time, my father drove him from the airport to Bury Place, and my father had this uh, white Jaguar Mark II, very nice car and smooth ride. It was like floating on air. Uh, red leather seats and worn up. It was very nice. So Prabhupada sat in the front with my father, and I sat in the back with uh, Pradumna and uh, Shamsunda, I believe. So we came down right near the, um, right alongside the British Museum. There's a three lane road that goes all the way down. Uh, the side of the British Museum as you're going down towards Bury Place at Holborn. And there's a hospital on one side and the British Museum on the other. And there's no pavement, there's just three lanes of road straight down there, so nowhere to go. And we were in the middle lane and there were two red double decker buses in the outside lanes. And as we were coming up on them, they closed in on us. And they almost closed right in on the car. It was very dangerous. And my father spontaneously screams, Harry Bo! <laughs> and slammed down on the gas pedal. And the car just took off through the gap. And the buses pulled apart as we went through. And Prabhupada turned to my father and he beamed at him. And uh, Years later, my father wrote me a letter and he said, remember when, when I was driving Swamiji uh, from the airport and those buses were closing in on us? He said, and I screamed, hurry, bowl. He said, and the buses parted just like the, the, red, the waves of the Red Sea parted for the Lord. So it was very nice because my father, he equated that experience of the buses parting when he screamed, hurry, bowl to the parting of the Red Sea, which was, for me, something special. One very significant thing happened in Boston in 1968. We had a new Back to Godhead, and it had a, uh, it was, I think, it was in May, because we were in Boston in May of 68. This particular Back to Godhead had an ad on the back cover. It looked very slick, at least graphic, graphics for those days. And it had a picture of Prabhupada, black and white, and said, this man changed the world. It looked pretty slick. Prabhupada called me in his room and handed it to me and said, look at this. And I was like, okay, I'm looking at it. What's wrong with it? <laughs> and he said, this is very bad. This is uh, very serious. The spiritual master should never be referred to as a man. Uh, this is the beginning of fall down. This consciousness to view the spiritual master as an ordinary man, as a man, to even call him a man, this is the beginning of fall down. Call Rai Rama. It, Rai Rama was responsible, I think, Rai Rama, uh, Jayadrita, uh, there were several in Boston at that time. Rai Rama was in charge, I believe. I'm not really sure of the person responsible for it, but I think it was Rai Rama. In any case, that's not the issue. The issue is that Prabhupada was very 
very seriously affected by this. And his explanation was that one should never, ever refer to or consider the spiritual master on the level of a man. Remember one day, though, he, he called me. I, it was Mangal Arti, and it, it was nice. And I was walking down the path on my way to the temple room, and I was singing Jasomati Nandana, kind of, you know, it was happy-go-lucky mood, right? Which was, when you're with Prabhupada, it's, that's the mood, you know, happy. Uh, and, and I was singing, and I heard him from his room ask Jagadish, is that Mahavir? <laughs> and, and, and he said, tell him to come in. So I, I kind of quickly, you know, went into Srila Prabhupada's, uh, Prabhupada's room, and, and he started talking to me. He goes, you know, he said, where in the world are there rivers like the Ganges, the Krishna, the Jamuna. He says, India has the most beautiful rivers. He says, there's only one other place in the world that has a beautiful river. And he said, the St. Lawrence. And it stunned me. I'm from Canada. And I said, I don't know if he's just saying that to make me feel good. I don't even know if he knows I'm from Canada. <laughs> I, I, but he said, that he mentioned the St. Lawrence, you know, that he thought that that was a, you know, of all the, all the he named all the rivers in India. And they said, one other place, the St. Lawrence. So, and then we talked about water, and, and he, 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 uh, he was talking about how all of, and I think he did a lot of this for my benefit, so that I would get the real picture of India, not get fried and burnt with the way India is, like the culture shock. He was talking about cleanliness, and he was talking about how all the local people, their dhotis look dirty. He said, but actually, none of those dhotis go 12 hours without being at least washed with water. He said, but because there's so much soil in the water that you know they don't use tide <laughs> you know or, or bleach that the 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 dhotis would stay with that kind of reddish or whatever color they had them so but they were always clean so you know he was taught he used to talk about the water and 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 sometimes was the rivers when we were in montreal Silla Prabhupada um, had asked the London Yatra to go to London and open a temple. That consisted of Malati and her husband Sham Sundar and Jamuna and Guru Das and Mukunda and Janaki. So they flew from San Francisco to Montreal to see Srila Prabhupada before going to London. Malati had just had a baby, Saraswati. And of course they came to see Srila Prabhupada and Malati's baby was on her hip she was always dancing with the baby. I was always amazed, you know, legs and arms were kind of flopping. The baby was on her hip when she would be dancing in kirtan. And when we came, they came to see Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada took the baby, little baby Saraswati, held her up over his head and said, so do you remember me? I'm your old friend. And of course, Srila Prabhupada indicated on many occasions that these children are so special. These children are children that have been brought in to spread Lord Chaitanya's movement, that have come from higher places, demigod lokas or higher dimensions, or who knows where they came from, but they've been brought in by Srila Prabhupada's request to spread Lord Chaitanya's mission. And I think one of the most important things that we can do in our lives is to let the children know this, how much Srila Prabhupada counted on them, how much he cared about them, and how important they are to him. Um, whatever has happened is unfortunate, but this is a very important part. He, he loved the children very, very much. He taught them. He wanted to teach them everything. When I was in Dallas, many years later, he was there for several days in Dallas. He gave lectures. Dayananda was the headmaster at the time. He gave lectures Every lecture was about teaching them with love, disciplining them only with love. If you love them, they will respond. They will want to, they will want to, uh, to do things properly, not with a heavy hand, but with love. Those lectures, I'm sure, we recorded and are available. Once uh, I was with Prabhupada and we were talking about my family because he got to know my mother and father and, you know, they visited him a few times. And Prabhupada said that, he said, because you are a devotee, he said, uh, 
28 generations of your family will be liberated. I said, well, what, what do you mean by liberated, Prabhupada? And he said, that means they will become devotees in their next life. I said, wow. I said, does that mean just my immediate family, like my mother and father and brothers and sisters, or does it mean my extended family, aunts and uncles? And He said, no, extended family. He said, everybody, aunts, uncles, everybody, 28 generations of your whole family become devotees. While living with Srila Prabhupada in Los Angeles in 1968, we did the drawing for the Bhagavad Gita and we also did the drawings for teachings of Lord Chaitanya. The drawings for teachings of Lord Chaitanya, they took quite a while. There were five of them. Srila Prabhupada supervised every aspect of them. There was a picture of the uh, Nabab coming to visit the Goswami, the, uh, the Rupa and Vishwanathan. There was a picture of uh, Jagannath with Lord Chaitanya in the Jagannath temple. At that time, I had no idea what the inside of Jagannath temple looked like. Srila Prabhupada described how it was dark and the Pujari is sitting up on the altar and he's handing down garlands. He described the in interior. So I did the painting or the drawing according to Srila Prabhupada's descriptions. Later, when those five drawings were removed from the book, Srila Prabhupada was totally disgusted. He said, why they have removed these drawings from this book? Why they have removed them? And he had personally overseen them. And so far as the uh, other illustrations, the, bug, the, the illustrations to Krishna book, one of his statements w about that when, the, when he saw that they had been removed was, why they have removed these paintings? Those paintings, those those early paintings were full of bhakti. They were full of bhakti. The mood was very uh, special, even though the technical quality of the paintings might not have been perfect. One particular lesson, <laughs> I guess you would call it, experience that I had with Prabhupada that till today I use, I use it in my business, I use it in management, something that is just, it's just so overwhelmingly important. Um, my wife was out in the gar his garden and I was fixing the garden and she was out there, you know, taking care of the plants and stuff and I, we were talking and I was speaking in Portuguese with her. So Prabhupada yelled out through his window for me to come inside. So I went inside the room and uh, he said, First he asked me, are you speaking Mexican? I said, no, Prabhupada, Portuguese. And then he said to me, look, you Americans, you ruin everything. He said, one of you come and you change everything the other one did. And then you go away and another one comes and he changes everything you did and he goes away and another one of you come and changes. He said, Stop changing everything. He said, just save it. <laughs> Don't change it, just save it. And, and, and that stuck in my brain since that day, that, that from now on, wherever I go and whatever I see and whatever needs to be fixed, I don't change it. I just, it's like I can hear, I, it's like as if it was yesterday, you know? Don't change it, just take what's there, you know, and, and just make it better, <laughs> you know, improve on the work that's already been put there, right? And make it, make it, you can improve it, you can make it better, but just don't go in and change it. And it was funny how he said that, that our nature is we just come in, just rip away everything the other guy did and do our thing. And, and, and so uh, that was a very beneficial lesson. So in Montreal, it was Srila Prabhupada's birthday, and I decided to make a cake for him and celebrate it like Western, Westerners do. So I baked a nice two-layer cake, frosted it, and put some candles on it, not 72, but a bunch of candles, and lit them all, and then brought it into his room. And as I brought it into his room, his eyes were big, and he said, oh, he was very surprised to see me carrying a flaming cake. 
So I put it on the altar and offered it, and then I brought it over to him and said, Srila Prabhupada, this is how we celebrate birthdays in America. And so if you blow out all the candles, you can make a wish. And so he blew out all the candles, and, but you don't have to tell anybody what you wish for. And so he blew out all the candles, and then I said, well, you don't have to tell anybody. He says, well, I wish only for Krishna service. Only for Krishna, only for Krishna service. And then, of course, we enjoyed the cake. Western style. I appreciated Prabhupada's strength. That, you know, th never giving up, fighting for Krishna. I, I, I think that one of my, you know, fondest thoughts of Prabhupada is when, when the anti-cult movement was really prominent and it was really giving us a lot of, you know, trouble. And Prabhupada, you know, was in New York. And, you know, he just, his statement was that I wanted to, you know, fight for Krishna with my last breath. So that, to me, was very, very, very significant and important. Uh, that strength that Prabhupada exhibited, that he'd never give up, no matter what the circumstances. And I felt that that Prabhupada was a real, you know, warrior. You know, Prabhupada was a real warrior for Krishna. You know, he would do anything for Krishna, whatever, whatever it took. Uh, he wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be a setback. It didn't matter. It was all, you know, and, that, and I think that, that, that strength was exhibited from the first time he came to America, you know, before he came to America, how to get here, you know, in Jaladutta, that strength, you know. You know so most people would have turned back and going through New York <coughs> in the early days. And then, of course, you know, he was such a great, he had so much strength that he could, he, you know, he had this vision of so many temples, so many devotees, and he would never give up, no matter <laughs> what the circumstances. So, yeah, I, I, I personally appreciate Srila Prabhupada for his you know, undaunting devotion and strength you know, to the instruction of his spiritual master and, of course, to Krishna. Thank you.